Jennifer, I've been interested in understanding how deception has um, uh, occurred and evolved in the animal world. Uh, you've studied cephalopods in, in, in specific uh, um, squids. Uh, what, what can you say about squid behavior that can be understood, in, in, at least in the broader sense, in, in, um, uh, in defining deception? Well, it takes a while to start because I really have to explain what the squid is doing. Think of a squid as kind of barrel shaped like this. Yeah. So it's got the skin all around. Now it's got chromatophores, color sacs on the skin. And because these are elastic sacs, which are pulled out by muscles and which are coordinated by nerves, all the cephalopods can change as much as 30, 30 milliseconds, which is very, very short. Sure, it's a 30th and, of a second, yeah. Yeah, and 30. they can change in as much as, as little as a square millimeter. So, like that. wow. I can't, yeah, even, yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine. <laughs> yeah. And there are patterns. And so how many okay. different colors, or what's their capability in, in, in the uh, Well, they've got, with the squid, they have yellow, red, and black chromatophores. But interestingly enough, when the chromatophores contract, they have leucophores and iridophores below. Okay, so if you don't have the colors, you have other colors. Oh. Um, in the case of the leucophores, what you've got is whatever light is coming in is reflected back. Mm -hmm. But with the iridophores, you have blues and greens. Hmm. So they, re they really are a rainbow wow. in many ways. And, and how finely controlled is that? Well. Milliseconds. I don't know. No, I understand the time frame, temporal and spatial. Right. But how about in terms of the color selection, or is it? Is it? Uh, okay. Well, so I have to try to explain okay. this. They yeah, can ahead. they can vary the intensity incredibly. Oh. So the squid have an agonistic display, which is called a zebra. It no self-respecting zebra would call it that. <laughs> but there's kind of diagonal slashes. They can, and that's an agonist, and, and that means, yeah, that means it it's uh, for predators? Or, or, well, or. It's, it's for each other, so it, but it's a display instead of fighting. Uh, uh -huh. so, okay, the squid don't fight each other. They have display fights. Oh. Okay, and it's usually male-male. We, we, humans can learn something from that. Yes, they could. <laughs> <laughs> so they can, because they have this exquisite control, right, they can vary the color of the background behind the stripes. They can vary the intensity of the darkness of the stripes. And they can vary the area that the stripes are shown on. Wow. So if yeah. you're a male and you're displaying to a male here, it's this side you want to show. But they can show as little of the zebra as one arm, or as much as the whole body with the arms spread wide and um, other accessory displays. So they have display fights in which one male will come on top of the other male. And it, it turns out this is ritualized in the sense that the above male has a darker background and so not as much contrast. And also the arms are spread less and the lower male, they're spread much wider. So it's symbolic in the sense that the bigger the male that shows the more display is already won. Mm. But it's also true that a male will, the adult male, will single out an adult female and separate her from the rest of the group, and then they'll exchange displays to mate with one another. Okay. And so most of the time when the male is consorting with the female, if there's another male over here and he's here, he will display to this other male. And the other male will also display, but this male will display more, more intense, as I said, darker stripes, bigger area, okay? He's trying to keep that other male away from yes. the female. Yeah. Yes, well, it, mostly it works. Yeah. So he's here, his display is more intense than his if they're still here. If this one comes closer, they both generate larger intensity, but his is still more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's a true display of what we might call resource holding potential. I've got the girl. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And if he comes in, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. Most of the time when these kinds of communications are being generated to one another, most of the time they're honest. 
This is the way it has to work. No communication system can work if everybody's deceiving everybody else all the time. Mm -hmm. It has to be the case that most of the time it is honest. And, and, and in the display fights between the, the, the males, what, what, what is the result? I know the result of the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sexual display because that's copulation. I mean, that, yep. that we know. But what, what on the male side is the result of, of their display fights? Does one just go off? The loser sort of goes, off, goes out of the territory? Well, they don't have a territory. Yeah, so. They hang around at schools. Right. Okay. But it would be the case that if a male is concerting with a female, another male comes up, they have a big display fight. Right. If this guy wins, he'd take over with the female. Oh, okay. And this guy loses, he'd go off. And you recognize that it's a loss because he did a better display than I did? Essentially, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. But this is where I found it really fascinating, and this is where the deception comes in, because most of the time, these are honest signals. Mm -hmm. But what I noticed is you'll have one or maybe several pairs of males and females, and the males consorting, holding on, and telling everybody to get lost. When the male and female exchange reproductive displays, sometimes a small male will come in and he'll do a big, full-out agonistic display. Ah! Yeah. Okay. And the male who's guarding the female who was about to mate with her will go, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he'll go over and display to this smaller male. And the smaller male who's not getting any mating opportunities may, in fact, do this several times. So the male and female are exchanging what we call saddle stripe, fl flicker, and they're all ready for the male to meet, which, by the way, he does by coming around to the side of the female and putting spermatophores at her dorsal arm bases. Uh -huh. Okay. So it's already, already, this guy comes in and he breaks off, <laughs> displays to him, comes back to the female. I watched one peripheral male do this 18 times. <laughs> and the concert male never did get a mating. <laughs> he was spending all his time fending off this guy. But that's deception in the sense that the juvenile male never could have beaten in a fair contest. So, he, but he was, what he was doing is he was displaying larger than his size should, should have Right. Allowed or should have? Yes, size, resource holding potential, reproductive potential, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. There could have been an advantage there to the peripheral male because in this particular species, they all hang around in groups, okay? And the bigger male will concert with the bigger female and try to mate with her. And eventually, the smaller male is going to grow up bigger and mm -hmm. then he can mate with the female mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. So it's potentially true that he could have been stopping a reproductive opportunity and that later in his life, he would have been the one to have that reproductive opportunity. Uh, oh, I see. Oh. And so therefore he is um, creating a deception by... But if he's smaller, couldn't the other male just enlarge himself to be bigger than that one? Did, did, they control the, did they control the size of their display, right? You said that? Well, they can control the area. The area, and they can, yeah. And the intensity, right. yes, indeed. Right. If the smaller male was uh, uh, displaying more intense or larger yeah. than he, he should have because of his size, couldn't the larger male just amp up his display because he's larger? Well, he did, and then he chased him away. Oh, oh, I see. But you see, in the process, the smaller male is distracting the bigger uh -huh. male oh. from reproducing. Oh, and you saw that 18 times on the <laughs> yes, same. I saw that 18 way. times. Did, did he eventually get his chance after the 18th time? The little time? one? No, the, the, the bigger one. No, at that point. The female got tired of him and just yeah, said, this guy's he, not performing. I don't know whether she got tired of him or whether <laughs> he got tired, but it was like, I mean, after 18 uh, uh, Oh, get lost. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Oh, that, that's, uh, yeah, that's terrific. Um, so do you see more deception in squid than you do in octopus? Yes, definitely. An octopus is solitary. And so in a way, it's not trying to deceive or impress conspecifics at all. Whereas the squid are permanently in groups, small groups in the case of the Caribbean reef squid, but small group, but yeah. groups nonetheless. And so they're they're with one another. They have the opportunity and the necessity 
to communicate because with one another. Group. So, so what we're saying, because squids are in group, so they have the uh, deception within the group of, 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 of signaling something that doesn't represent their size, or for example, whereas both have uh, camouflage uh, kinds of deception, which is a, I don't know if you call it a lower level deception, but a, a, a less, um, it's, a, it's a deception that uh, deals with the environment rather, yes. than, rather than, than, than affecting the behavior, specific behavior in a way. Uh, so, so how do you, because octopus and squid both have camouflage types of behavior. Correct. Which is a kind of deception. I'm, I'm pretending to be like the background when I'm really not. I mean, that's a deception, <laughs> right? Um, so then how are you differentiating the kind of deception that's a camouflage deception, which both octopus and squid do, and the kinds of, of social deception that a squid will do that an octopus won't because an octopus is not operating in a social environment? That's correct. Uh, the squid don't have a lot of camouflage deception. Okay. Um, I notice it particularly when they're small and they use color patterns, arm posture and body posture. Sometimes they want to look like floating seaweed. Hmm. But it's a difficult situation for a squid. If you're out in the middle of everywhere, nowhere, people can see you, fish can see you actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from above, from below, from the left, from the right. And so it's harder to deceive if you're floating out in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, the kind of deception we're talking about is one is a camouflage kind of deception and the other is a display deception. That's so, right. So, so, so how, how do you differentiate those two kinds of deceptions? I mean, in terms of their, the um, kind of the, the, the foundational element of, of, of the concept of deception. Well, I suppose in the sense that the octopus simply does deceive without, as far as I can tell, consciously thinking about the audience or the particular situation, it's, it's semi-automatic. It's a, like a, re a reflex. No, I, no, it's not a reflex. It's a very, very sophisticated change. Okay. On the other hand, the octopus is capable of doing the startle displays, and there are some species that are capable of doing sexual displays, so it's not that they can't use this system for communication uh -huh. other than this sort of automatic okay. camouflage. Okay. But the squid seems much more concerned, particularly in reproductive, in the reproductive period at the end of their life, and genuinely exchanging displays with other individuals and uh, fighting, or not really fighting because it's visual fights, visual fight. and displaying males to females. And, and so I'm, I'm just trying to <laughs> dig the the differentiation in in the deception between a a camouflage to the background, which is which is uh, automatic, yep. uh, like an or, or, yep. uh, autonomous nervous system or something, uh, versus the uh, the more active display, right. which is also you know we're not we're not trying we're not trying to discern the mental. <laughs> what's happening in, mentally, but just trying to discern, at least from a behavioral point of view, the difference between a camouflage deception and a display deception. I would have to say the display de deception is deliberate. Okay, deliberate. So that's an interesting word. In the sense that the animal must have planned it in a way that it doesn't seem to be true for camouflage. Okay, so that's a very critical distinction. Oh, yes. if, if that's, if, if, and, and what gives you that confidence to make that sharp distinction? I suppose in the sense that it is not what would be expected of the straightforward situation. So if you have a subordinate oh. and a dominant male, okay. the subordinate would be expected to make a display that was not as good as the dominance. Oh, I see. Okay. So in a situation where it's it's violating this sort of basic, I'm a subordinate, I don't look as good as the dominant, right. then it would have to be somehow or other, I hate to say this, making a decision perhaps mm -hmm. to violate this sort of rule that, that if you're a subordinate, you don't make as intense displays as the dominant. 
because all the camouflage decisions are automatic and they're always done. They're always they always match the background in some way. That's a that's a behavior. Here you're you're, you're having a, a violation. So it's a it's another level because you're adding uh, you're adding the active um, decision, as you said. Uh, it could be automatic, but it's an active process of violating a norm. I think so. Okay. It's always very, very difficult to tell because I don't know what goes on in the squid's mind <laughs> much as I would like to. 